Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. Today's speaker is Dr. Brenna Keene, a third year resident, almost finished uh, the Carilion Pediatric Program. Dr. Keene uh, attended UNC Chapel Hill, where she achieved a bachelor's in science in public health nutrition. She went on to the West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine for her training prior to joining Carilion. Um, while at Carilion, her CV makes me tired. Um, she has been extremely busy. She has presented at the World Congress of Gastroenterology and Hepatology in Montreal, um, as well as Carilion Clinic Research Day twice. She has three, public, three manuscripts uh, uh, accepted for publication, one in a journal of hospital pediatrics, which is out, and two pending in ENT and in review. She has lent her time to numerous committees and QI projects while here at Carilion. She will be staying on as the fourth year chief uh, next year and working finally in outpatient pediatrics, first person ever, um, and will be pursuing a fellowship in gastroenterology afterwards. Please welcome Dr. King. Dr. Permeshwar, um, so I'm going to talk about pediatric functional GI disorders, and I chose this topic because uh, I felt like it would impact a lot of us. We see it um, in the outpatient setting, inpatient setting, uh, and other subspecialty clinics besides just GI. Uh, so I hope you all will find it useful. I have no uh, disclosures. And first, what, what are functional gastrointestinal disorders? Uh, they comprise a wide range of conditions related to the GI tract uh, that cannot be attributed to either structural or biochemical abnormalities. Pathophysiology is, is not 100% uh, understood, but there's multiple factors involved, including genetic predisposition, impaired pain, regulatory system, sensory input such as intestinal distension, psychological vulnerability, uh, coping style, family stressors. Life, and life events early on and environmental factors. So this diagram just depicts sort of um, how sensitizing medical events and psychological events impact um, the ultimate um, genetic predisposition, uh, ultimately influencing abdominal pain uh, and other GI problems. So why do we, why do we care? Um, it's, it's, these disorders are extremely common in children of all ages, and the symptoms uh, have a significant impact on families, quality of life for, for the patient, and healthcare utilization and related costs. This uh, diagram depicts how um, sort of the psychological stressors and GI physiology can contribute to a pain episode, and then how over time, uh, depending on whether uh, there's maladaptive responses or accommodation. You can have chronic pain disability or normal development and no disability. Um, so how a, how a child and his or her family copes with pain truly, truly does influence the outcomes. Um, and as um, we know that this can, this can contribute to a lot of um, chronic um, disability. So Rome 4 was published in 2016, and this is uh, an update from Rome 3 uh, on terminology diagnostic criteria. Uh, these two chapters um, specifically fo uh, focus on childhood functional GI disorders, first in the neonate and toddler, and then second in the child and adolescent. Uh, so I'm going to spend a um, decent portion of time going through what constitutes the diagnostic criteria, because some of that has changed. But first, uh, the, these two introductory videos I found helpful, so I'm going to attempt to play them. Our chapter was oh, entitled uh, the... This is it. Hi, uh, my name is Samuel Nurko. Uh, I am the chair of the Childhood Functional Gastrointestinal Disorders Neonate Toddler Committee. I had the pleasure of working with my co-chair, Mark Benichna, and other members of the committee, including included Christopher, Paul Hyman, Ian St. James Roberts, and Neil Schechter. 
Um, our chapter addresses the functional <laughs> eye disorders in the neonate and toddler age group. And we review extensively the epidemiological data as well as the evidence-based treatments for these common disorders. Uh, from the first time, we are also including information on the neurobiology of pain in infants and toddlers. And the revised four, uh, ROM4 criteria continue to stress the biopsychosocial approach. And functional symptoms in infants and toddlers uh, sometimes can be part of normal development, for example, in infant regurgitation, or they may arise from maladaptive behavioral response to internal or external stimuli. For example, retention of feces in the rectum that often re uh, results from an experience with painful defecation. And the clinical expression of functional disorders at this age group obviously varies because it depends on their individual stage of development, uh, particularly in regard to their physiologic, autonomic, affective, and intellectual development. It's important to notice that as the child gains the verbal skills necessary to report pain, it is then possible to diagnose pain-predominant functional GI disorders. And given that through the first years, children cannot also accurately report other symptoms like nausea or pain, or they cannot discriminate between emotional and physical distress, we depend a lot on reports and interpretation of the parents who know their child best and the observations of trained clinicians who are trying to differentiate between health and illness. It's important to notice that we have a partnership with the parent, so the decision to seek medical care for the symptoms arises from the caretakers and concerns for the child. And this threshold for concern varies depending on previous experiences and expectation, coping style of the caregivers and perception of illness. And therefore, this is very important that we stress this. Any intervention must attend to both the child and the family. The effective management depends on securing a therapeutic alliance with the parents. And I think this is one of the most important things, uh, points to take. We need to work together with the family and the parents. We need to be sure that the normal physiological events of the children are considered as such and not an illness. And we need to continue to rely on the biopsychosocial model for the treatment of these children. My name is uh, Carlo Di Lorenzo, and I am the chair of the Rome for Child, Children and Adolescent Chapter of Functional GI Disorders. The other committee members are Dr. Jeff Hyams, Dr. Miguel Sapp, Dr. Rob Schumann, Dr. Anna Maria Sayano, and Miranda Van Tilburg. This chapter addresses functional disorders in all children and adolescents. There are 12 pediatric functional disorders that are addressed, and here is the main points and take home messages. Characterization of childhood adolescent functional gastrointestinal disorders has evolved during the two decades long process, now culminating in Rome 4. The era of diagnosing a functional GI disorder only when organic diseases have been excluded is waning, as we now have evidence to support symptom based diagnosis. In the child adolescent Rome 4, we extend this concept by removing the need that there was no evidence for organic diseases in all definitions. And we replace it with a sentence that says that after appropriate medical evaluation, the symptoms cannot be attributed to another medical condition. This change allows the clinician to perform selective or no testing to support a positive diagnosis of a functional GI disorder. We also point out the functional GI disorders can indeed coexist with other medical conditions that themselves result in GI symptoms, such as inflammatory bowel disease or other peptic disorders. In Rome 4, functional nausea and functional vomiting are now described for the first time. Rome 3, abdominal pain related functional gastrointestinal disorders has been changed to functional abdominal pain disorders to make it easier. And we have derived a new term, functional abdominal pain not otherwise specified to describe children who do not fit a specific disorder such as IBS, functional dyspepsia, or abdominal migraine. 
Rome 4 functional GI disorder definition should indeed enhance clarity for both clinicians and researchers. So there's um, a couple other publications from Rome 4. One is specific to um, functional GI disorders for primary care and non-GI clinicians, if anyone's interested. Um, those are available online. So first, the neonates and toddlers, these are the list of uh, diagnoses. Um, and again, we're just going to go through terminology so everyone can be on, on the same page with sort of updated terminology from Rome 4 and, and uh, the diagnostic criteria for each of these. So first uh, is infant regurgitation, which includes um, both of the following in an otherwise healthy infant between three weeks and 12 months of age. So regurgitation two or more times a day for three or more weeks. And then no retching, hematemesis, aspiration, apnea, failure to thrive, no, no um, other um, medical problems. Um, infant rumination syndrome, which in, must include all of these criteria for at least two months. And, consist of repetitive contractions of the abdominal muscles, diaphragm, tongue, and effortless regurgitation of gastric contents with are either expelled from the mouth or can be rechewed and re-swallowed. And then um, either, either three or more of the following, onset between three and eight months, does not respond to management for um, reflux, and is unaccompanied by signs of distress, does not occur during sleep, and when the infant is interacting uh, with individuals in the environment. Cyclic vomiting syndrome in infants and um, toddlers, so must include all, all of the following, two or more periods of unremitting uh, paroxysmal vomiting with or without retching, lasting hours to days within a six-month period. Uh, they are separated by weeks to months with a return to baseline health in between episodes, and they are stereotypical in each patient. And infant colic, uh, of course. So. Most of us are familiar with the, um, the Rome 3 report included that um, outlines the rule of three criteria in which um, to diagnose infant colic, a crying had to start and stop suddenly and occur for three or more hours per day, at least three days a week. But because um, research has found that these criteria uh, fail to um, truly capture um, infant colic because one, the criteria, they're arbitrary, the numbers. Um, they're culturally dependent and they're impractical to use. So also the, um, the rule of threes focuses, focuses on crying amount and not, um, which has not been shown to be as distressing as like the difficult to console um, the nature um, of, the, of the crying. So this is the proposed uh, def new definition in which an infant is less than five months of age when symptoms start and stop and they have recurrent and prolonged periods of crying, fussing or irritability Reported, reported by caregivers that occur without obvious cause, it cannot be prevented or resolved, uh, and there's no evidence of infant failure to thrive, fever, or illness. Functional diarrhea, so this is uh, previously known as toddler's diarrhea, also has been called chronic nonspecific diarrhea. Uh, so this is a daily painless recurrent passage of four or more large unformed stools, and symptoms last at least four weeks. Uh, onset between six and 60 months of age, and no failure to thrive. And then infant dysphesia uh, in an uh, infant less than nine months of age, in which uh, at least 10 minutes of straining and crying before a successful or unsuccessful passage, passage of soft stools. The key is that the stools are soft and there's no other health problems. And then functional constipation which must include uh, one month of, of at least two of the following in infants up to four, and then in toilet trained children, the additional criteria at the bottom can be used, but um, you, you need two or, four, two or fewer defecations per week, a history of excessive stool retention, history of painful or hard bowel movements, uh, history of large diameter stools, uh, and the presence of large fecal mass in the rectum, and then in the toilet trained children, you can have um, either an episode a week of incontinence after potty training um, or history of large diameter stools that can obstruct the toilet. Okay, so this is 
to remind me. We're going to attempt to do um, some questions. So if, if you guys have used Poll Everywhere before, we're going to use um, Poll Everywhere. But first, you were seeing a two-year-old girl in your office for evaluation of diarrhea, which has persisted for eight weeks. Her mother describes five to seven liquid stools per day with no visible blood. Uh, she denies any abdominal symptoms, fevers, or con constitutional symptoms. No recent travel, well water use, exposure to reptiles or ill contacts, or recent viral illnesses. And on PE, she's well nourished, well hydrated, and is growing appropriately. So of the following, this girl's most likely diagnosis. So if you have the app, then you can um, join with the login. And if you don't have that, then you can text that information to the number 37607 to join. And then, just, and then you can click A, B, C, or D. Doesn't work. Oh. oh. <coughs> you have to get more time to the old That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Text this to the number 37607 if you haven't joined before. Mm -mm. Yeah, I think we got it. Okay, so you guys. Um, yeah, so this is that this is a toddler's diarrhea, chronic nonspecific diarrhea, which is now which is now called functional diarrhea. Um, and then the next one, we have a three-year-old boy who comes in with a history of recurrent rectal prolapse without visible blood. He began having prolapse with bowel movement six weeks ago, and it occurs with every bowel movement, resolves without intervention. There, his bowel movements are described as cluster of Clusters of grapes, his mom denies fever, recent illness, diarrhea, um, poor growth, and PE shows height and weight at, a, at the 50th percentile. His abdomen is mildly distended with positive bowel sounds, and his rectal examination uh, identifies a normally placed anus without hemorrhoids or fissures. So the following, the most likely diagnosis for this child is, I think I might just call on people this time. Henry? No, we've all joined. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Oh. Okay. If you're all already logged in, we just texted the letter. <laughs> So most people are saying functional constipation, which is the correct answer. So um, key points here are that rectal constipation is the most common cause of rectal um, prolapse, more common than, than cystic fibrosis, which can also cause um, rectal prolapse. So going into children and adolescents, uh, this is in the video. Um, uh, it was explained that each of these diagnoses uh, includes the criteria that after appropriate medical evaluation, 
um, symptoms cannot be attributed to another medical condition. So I didn't type that over on each of the following slides. Um, we're going to go through these. Uh, and these are in children and adolescents. So cyclic vomiting syndrome, you um, must have two or more periods of intense unremitting nausea and paroxysmal vomiting that last hours to days within a six-month period. Uh, they're separated, again, weeks to months with return to baseline health between, and they can be uh, stereotypical in each patient. Func this functional nausea uh, must be ongoing for two months, and it's bothersome. Nausea is a predominant symptom that occurs at least twice per week, generally not related to meals and not consistently associated with vomiting. Functional vomiting, um, on average, one or more episodes of vomiting per week for two, the last two months, and absence of self-induced vomiting or criteria for an eating disorder or rumination uh, must be um, present. So rumination syndrome, uh, for the last two months, you have someone with repeated regurgitation and rechewing or expulsion of food that begins soon after a meal and does not occur during sleep and is not preceded by retching. Aerophasia, uh, again, for the last two months, you can have excessive air swallowing, um, uh, abdominal distension due to uh, intraluminal air, which increases throughout the day, and then essentially excessive gassiness. Uh, this is, you have to have all these criteria. Um, functional dyspepsia, one or more of the following bothersome symptoms for at least four days per month for the last two months, uh, postprandial fullness, early satiety, satiation, uh, epigastric pain, or burning that's not associated with defecation. An irritable bowel syndrome uh, must include all of the following in, again, two months. So first is abdominal pain that uh, is associated with one or more of the following related to defecation change in frequency of stool or change in the appearance of the stool. And then in children with constipation, the pain does not resolve um, with resolution of constipation. If the pain does resolve, um, then you're dealing with functional constipation and not irritable bowel. Abdominal migraine, so this, uh, you have all the following at least twice in the last six months. Um, paroxysmal episodes of intense acute peri umbilical midline or, or diffuse abdominal pain that lasts at least an hour, and this should be the most distressing symptom. The episodes are separated by weeks to months. The pain is, uh, in, is incapacitating and interferes with normal activities and is associated with two or more of the following, so anorexia, nausea, vomiting, headache, photophobia, or, pal or pallor. And then this is the... Um, the newer, the new diagnosis of functional abdominal pain not otherwise specified, uh, in which there's insufficient criteria for irritable bowel, um, functional dyspepsia, or abdominal migraine, and you have episodic or continuous abdominal pain that does not occur solely uh, during physiologic events. Uh, and this is four times per month for the last two months. So uh, functional constipation is similar to the prior diagnosis in the infants and toddlers. Um, in the older children, uh, two or four, um, two or fewer def defecations in the toilet per week. In a child who's developmentally age four or older, at least one episode of, of fecal incontinence per week, and um, history of posturing or stool retention, uh, painful hard bowel movements presence of large fecal mass in the rectum or um, large uh, diameter stools that can obstruct the toilet. And then no lastly, non-retentive fecal incontinence is, uh, again, a child uh, with a developmental age of at least four who has a one-month history of defecation in places inappropriate to um, not socially acceptable, and there's no evidence of fecal retention. Okay, so two more questions to try to test what we learned. Um, what you have, you're seeing a 14-year-old adolescent girl in her office, in your office, for her health supervision visit. On review of systems, she reports she has frequent episodes of abdominal pain. Uh, they are periumbilical, come on quickly. Pain is 7 to 10 out of 10. And she usually has associated symptoms, uh, nausea, vomiting, headache, and denies fevers, joint pain, rash, diarrhea, weight loss. In between, she does in between episodes, she does feel well. 
On PE, she, her weight is 52 kilos, heart rate 92, respiration 15, and blood pressure is 103 over 78. So the following the diagnosis most consistent with this patient's presentation is So um, most everyone is saying abdominal migraine, which is a correct answer. Uh, and then you have a 15-year-old adolescent brought to the office for vomiting. Uh, he describes effortless postprandial regurgitation after at least one meal daily for one month. Occasionally, he'll re-swallow his food. Complains of frequent abdominal pain and nausea, but no diarrhea or bloating, and has lost two kilos over the last month. He's taken an over-the-counter H2 blocker without improvement. So of the following, the most likely diagnosis for him. So almost um, most people are saying rumination disorder, which is correct. Um, this this is difficult to diagnose, and it's frequently um, frequently it has delayed diagnoses. Um, and um, should be considered because of the effortless uh, daily vomiting. So switching gears to treatment, um, just an overview of treatment, um, some of these disorders. So first, infant colic, which we're all very familiar with. Uh, of course, reassurance is recommended. There's no evidence that pharmacologic uh, interventions are useful, uh, and there's inadequate evidence about the effectiveness of probiotics, el el elimination of cow's milk protein from mom's diet or baby's diet, um, and, and herbal interventions. Infant dyskesia, again, reassurance uh, and education about the pathophysiology, which is uncoordinated defecation dynamics uh, in uh, a baby, and avoidance of anal stimulations and, and laxatives. Cyclic vomiting syndrome, this clinical report was, was um, published in 2008 from North American Society uh, Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatitis, Hepatology and Nutrition, or NASAGAN. Um, and so this I'm going to go through a couple recommendations. Um, lifestyle changes first in uh, cyclic vomiting syndrome. There's no published, published trials that evaluate the impact of lifestyle changes, but the uh, consensus of the uh, task force was that these um, can uh, reduce episode frequency in children with cyclic vomiting syndrome. So besides reassurance, avoidance of triggers, keeping a vomiting diary, uh, potential factors. Um, Avoiding fasting, uh, maintaining good sleep hygiene, tr triggering foods, uh, avoidance of triggering foods like chocolate, cheeses, um, and avoiding excessive energy output or over-exercising. Um, that's also in the migraine headache lifestyle interventions, regular meal schedules, and, um, and moderation or uh, avoidance of caffeine. There are some prophylactic or preventative medications that you can use in children five years or younger. Antihistamines are first, the first choice, um, specifically ciproheptidine, and uh, beta blockers uh, for perinolol specifically is, is second line. In children older than five years, um, tricyclic antidepressants and metriptyline specifically is first recommended, and then again, propranolol as a, as a second line. Uh, for acute episodes, so supportive care, um, providing low st stimulation environment, uh, IV fluids, 
uh, they're an emergency department, uh, anti-emetic agents, uh, specifically on Dancitron, sedatives, you can use either diphenhydramine or, or lorazepam, and then analgesics, um, narcotics, or uh, relax. For IBS, there is some um, evidence that probiotics are useful. There's one uh, small prospective double-blind trial that reported efficacy of peppermint oil in reducing the pain severity, and there's um, a double-blind crossover trial suggesting efficacy of FODMAP reduction to the FODMAP diet. Um, and this was a review article published in Pediatrics in 2015 uh, in, that consisted of 24 randomized control trials, uh, including 13, 1,390 children. The quality of the evidence was found to be very low to moderate, but it's still <laughs> worth talking about. Um, so the results, they um, came up with significant improvement of abdominal pain that was reported after hypnotherapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, lactobacillus, and then the VSL, number three, is a, um, is a probiotic mixture. So those were associated specifically with significantly more treatment responders. Um, and guar gum, which is a fiber supplement, significantly improved IBS symptom frequency, but no effect was found for other fiber supplements in the study or uh, lactose-free diet. This is one of the uh, studies Dr. Hart has sent out on his blog uh, fairly recently uh, that he shared. Uh, so this was published in Lancet Gastroenterology and Hepatology recently, uh, last October, and it's a randomized um, sham controlled trial evaluating the efficacy of um, percutaneous electrical nerve field stimulation in adolescents with abdominal pain-related functional GI disorders. That abdominal pain-related functional GI disorders, again, that's like the old terminology. Um, so the results are uh, that the uh, Neurostim, which is U.S. Um, Food and Drug Administration, Administration Cleared Device, has sustained efficacy for abdominal pain-related functional GI disorders in adolescents, and it's a safe and effective approach that should be considered as a non-pharmacologic um, alternative for these disorders. Okay, so two more questions. Um, the three-month-old female infant is brought to your office for excessive crying. Her mother reports that she cries consistently for three or four hours most evenings. She sometimes improves when being held and carried but still seems upset. Her mother reports that her belly feels gassy and that she has tried some methicone drops in the evening, but this does not help. The infant is breastfeeding and her mother has tried eliminating milk and soy from her diet. You diagnose infant colic. So the following the most appropriate step in the management of the infant's symptoms is to recommend <laughs> yeah, so not, none of these, um, these others have been shown to be effective. So swaddling, gentle rocking, and decreased stimulation. Okay. Uh, and lastly, you're seeing a 16-year-old adolescent girl in your office for recurrent abdominal pain. It's peri umbilical, it occurs five to six times weekly, and it describes a twisting feeling that ranges from four to seven on a scale of 10. No uh, associated fever, weight loss, nausea, vomiting. She does note an improvement in uh, symptoms after defecation about half of the time and was seen in the ED two weeks ago for an episode of, of pain, at which time laboratory studies were ordered and are shown here, um, uh, all of which are normal. You believe she meets the criteria for a diagnosis of abdominal, I mean, irritable bowel syndrome. So uh, what is the best treatment? option for her.
Yeah, this is the um, peppermint oil. Okay. So next, um, I wanted to discuss the handouts. So these, there's three handouts, and uh, I can, I'm happy to share um, for those of you listening in or if you still have someone back. So Community Care of North Carolina was a collaboration, collaboration of pediatric um, GI docs in North Carolina um, across the state, so Duke, UNC, ECU, Wake Forest, uh, in addition to primary care providers, and they developed this guideline that's aimed at PCPs and explains the treatment uh, and referral process for functional abdominal pain in pediatric patients, so I thought it was um, worthwhile sharing that. There's also a an algorithm for functional abdominal pain, and then tips for providers. So one, um, one item I did want to highlight, principles of treatment for functional abdominal pain in this guideline was uh, for primary care providers to first acknowledge that pain is real, and uh, second, to educate um, families and patients about the brain-gut axis and life stressors to identify precipitating factors and associating factors. Um, to minimize pain with diet, lifestyle, um, for constipation uh, being treated, and then, and then reassurance, uh, emphasizing coping mechanisms and, and CVT. And many children will respond uh, to these simple measures. Um, in others, the pain will continue and become severe enough, impacting their, their quality of life enough that um, referral to pediatric GI is recommended. So specifically, um, this guideline talks about referring to pediatric gastroenterologists if there's presence of, of red flags which are listed, uh, if, there's, if, if the symptoms worsen and cause loss of functionality, um, interference with school attendance, sleep, or pleasurable activities. And then also with the caveat to refer to behavioral health professional um, skilled in CBT, specifically if there are no red flags and there is concern about underlying anxiety and or um, other mental health problems. Okay, so these are all my references. There's plenty of time for questions. And um, I want to thank Dr. Hart, he's on the line in Lynchburg, for reviewing three drafts of this presentation. <laughs> Questions or comments in the room? I'm sure Dr. Hart's on the line, so he will want to make a comment. All right. Use the phones here. If you are on the line and you do not want to make a comment or ask a question, just please put your phone on mute now. The conference is now in talk mode. Okay. Anyone on the line want to ask a question or make a comment? Dr. Hart, I just wanted to congratulate Dr. King. Great job. Yeah. Dr. Hart. Anyone else? Okay. I'm going over to you. I just had a question. Um, you know, some of these diagnoses, the, the time frame in which you assess that are so prolonged, like six months or so, that, you know, anything could happen within that time. The kid could have a couple intestinal viral illnesses. I wonder how you sort that out. And, and another practical question is, when do we know that constipation is really gone? <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think how to answer that. Do you, want, do you want to take a swing at that one? Yeah. Oh. All right. Okay. Again, my, my quip was it's never gone, right? Um, I, I do think that, that, Brenna, you did a very good job at kind of highlighting you know, the, the, the um, parallels with irritable bowel syndrome and with constipation. And if symptoms improve, we don't say it's IBS. Um, I, I think that, I mean, in our, in our offices, we've got our poop chart. You know, you, sometimes kids don't want to tell you what their poop looks like. They say, oh, they never look. Um, but if the history is not consistent with constipation, I'm not sure they necessarily need imaging to prove that. Um, but I just think it, it boils down to history and physical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Dr. Hart, I just wanted to add to that as well. I think Dr. Tamez's uh, question is really a very good one because many times patients don't slide into uh, a category when we first see them. We say, gosh, this could be cyclical vomiting, but it hasn't met the criteria or it's going to evolve into irritable bowel and so forth. And the current theory that Dr. Nurko and, and DiLorenzo uh, highlighted in their video in the Rome 4 criteria is if you look at the natural history of irritable <coughs> It's genetic predisposition with that environmental trigger that Dr. Keene talked about, which, if you will, sensitizes the gut, both sensory and motility-wise, to then evolve into a more classic <clears throat> bowel. And the analogy that's frequently used is the scar analogy. You know, we've all had scars, or many of us have scars in our bodies, and the sensation, the somatic sensory nerves around the scar are quite different. They can be hyposensitive, hypersensitive. We think many times infections trigger this underlying genetic predisposition. And then that uh, first couple of slides Dr. Keene pointed out, I think really highlight that this can evolve into a, a more classic pattern. It takes time. And that's sort of like genetics. You know, give us time, we'll see in six months, and then it'll evolve into a more classic pattern and uh, make the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is Emily Doherty. So you said the word genetics like four times. So that, of course, gets my attention. Um, I, I wanted to know whether uh, we are seeing in the literature that when one family member reports signs of functional bowel symptoms, uh, do we have a higher incidence of functional bowel symptoms in other family members? And is that part of the history we should be collecting? Uh, and also for Dr. Hart, regarding genetics, are we starting to see any specific genetic markers that seem to be linked to predisposition to functional bowel complaints, or are there any particular genes in a class such as pain perception that seem to be emerging in the literature? Well, uh, Dr. Keene, do you want to answer that based on your research, or do you want me to jump in? You can jump in. <laughs> uh, the, the thing that's, you know, your, your point's very well taken, and, and the answer is yes. In fact, Prometheus, which is one of those labs that many of us order, it's out of Southern California, that basically you know, gives you the IBD, SGI, and many of our residents and, and staff are familiar with ordering Prometheus labs. They actually brought to the market about seven, eight years ago a test that never really got legs to it called the IBS serology, the irritable bowel, in which case they actually did look at specific uh, cytokine markers and, and some SNP mutations to see if there was, because there, there is data to suggest that there are certain um, uh, markers, if you will, bio biologic, pharmacologic markers that do predispose individuals and are consistent with an irritable bowel pattern, if you will. It's sort of along the line of the non-celiac gluten sensitivity. It hasn't quite got the scientific uh, power yet to really get good sensitivity and specificity, but it, there will be. I, th I think the answer is yes. And no, to answer your question about family history, I, it's unequivocal that the family history is important. We ask all the time, typically when you get family history, you get it from the parents that these kids who start evolving into cyclical vomiters or classic IBS, all of a sudden you pull out family history. When you ask about the right questions, you get family history of migraine and other sorts of dysregulation in terms of some of that sensory uh, apparent processing. And so family history is critically important, uh, as it is for other things like milk protein intolerance, et cetera, and IBD. Thanks so much for that very nice explanation. I appreciate it. Hey, it's Mandy Atkinson. I just have a question or some points maybe. I think we all see a lot of children with kind of these multi-symptom constellations and um, abdominal pain and fatigue tend to, be, tend to be, kind of go together and are certainly in a lot of the children that we see. And I'm wondering if putting a name to some of these symptoms has helped <laughs> actually with symptomatology. Um, and then also how you get maternal buy-in for some of these diagnoses, because I think that's a, a big obstacle with a lot of these children. Shut up. <laughs> All right, coming over to you. Thank you, Monday. It's, it's, a, it's a big deal to um, reassure parents and for them to believe that there is nothing wrong with their 15-year-old that cannot go to school because she or he vomits in the morning or whether the pain is so severe that they, he must have something wrong. And um, so reassurance is, of course, very important. 
and it takes a lot of time. Um, the psycho um, social aspect of uh, therapy and imagery, you know, and all that is, is extremely important, but the, the, the main challenge is for them to buy on that so for, because uh, everybody wants a quick fix. So um, we have the experience that, it, you know, it, we have tried to project that, you know, um, uh, help, but at the same time, um, they, they just want the medicine, they just want something quick, or they, they just want more testing. So, so there has to be a balance between the way that you pre present, everything is normal, but at the same time, I think that is in this real life and this, in, in the clinical world, we have to give some degree of a chance to the parents to reassure themselves that your child is so. So we frequently have to go in and do some testing and do some um, x-rays, or even though if we understand and we disclose to them that things are normal. And the same with endoscopy. Probably, likely, 90 plus percent of our endoscopies are essentially good, not normal, but at the same time, after we have disclosed and we tell them the likelihood that is that this is going to be normal. Uh, and it's terrible to say that reassurance is it, that's a, a very expensive and not indicated reassurance, but we frequently have to go into that in real life. Yes. But I, first of all, I think that gets to the point of the new criteria that for some of us is two or three testing to reassure families, for others it's a little more. Um, but I do think this speaks to how we all need to be work. I mean, I know I sound like Pollyanna, but we all need to be working together. It can be very hard to establish rapport and and um, kind of um, buy-in from the family when when they say, oh, my doctor, and I'm not putting anybody under the bus, oh, my doctor is so concerned, must go to GI because this problem needs to be fixed. We're all over the chart. It says, I think this kid has IBS. I think if as pediatricians in the front line, we start that conversation and we say, yes, of course, we'll refer to GI, but I think this is this, and these are the strategies to help, then it, it comes, it, it's more of a reinforcement when you see the subspecialist and you, and you say the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just wanted to chime in, too. I think, boy, Dr. G and Dr. O hit spot on there, as well as Dr. Keene. I think the key is, um, and numerous studies show this in both adult and pediatric medicine, that even the physician's attitude towards treating this defines how the outcome is. In other words, if, if and parents actually sell, parents and patients self-select, those physicians who are receptive to this, pro, uh, this whole concept of functional abdominal pain and the modulatory effect of our emotions on this have better outcomes. The, where the physicians say, oh, you're crazy, get out of my office, uh, not surprisingly, they have a poorer outcome. So I think <coughs> recognition that the pain is real the explanation that there's dysregulation in the mo in, in the processing, and understanding that you don't cure this thing, you you modify the 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 uh, approach to it, and you identify triggers and so forth and so on. I think that that's really key, and and I agree with Dr. O and Dr. G heartily that our testing we do nine times out of ten is to reassure the family, and I tell them going into the blood test or the stool test or the scope test, that this is to just reassure us that your child does not also have X, Y, or Z. And then when the tests come back normal, it reaffirms our conclusion, not undermines it. Sort of like, oh, they didn't find the uh, cancer that I'm sure that they had, and then it must be a wacky doctor, which if we lay out the expectations that our testing is going to be reassure, reassuring, then when it comes back normal, it's reassuring. If it comes back abnormal, we look like geniuses. So it, it would be a no-lose situation if we uh, lay the right groundwork in the preparation for the testing. Thank you, Dr. Hart. Okay. One last kind of pseudo-apology to my GI colleagues. colleagues. Um, maybe a couple times a month I get kids with similar symptoms wondering if this is food allergy, and I take a similar approach. I explain what true food allergy is and do the testing just, again, for reassurance. But ultimately, I, also, I push, put, them, put them into your um, purview. But just, just another thing, if, if you're going to send them to allergy as well, just explain to them what true food allergy is. And again, foods may affect 
some of their GI symptoms, but it's often not. It's generally not IgE mediated. <laughs> no, I, I think that is, I could just chime in. Dr. Jejo's bacon, and the biggest group of patients that this applies to is the probably the autistic population, where every parent is convinced that their child has a gluten-free casein for you know casein-free diet need, which 99.9 .9 times out of 100 is not true. But the perception is reality. So in, in, when we do the diagnostic testings and they all come back negative or do the scope, et cetera, I will then take the family through a, the scientific principles of a semi-blinded food challenge to prove to them, either blinding the husband, the, the, fa the father, the mother, a therapist, or somebody else, because many times our parents get on the Internet and they say, oh, well, they must have, uh, you know, must be a gluten problem, which, of course, is total bunk. But we don't, I think we lose credibility if we just say, you're an idiot, get out of my office. I'd rather basically take them through sort of the Koch principles to scientifically prove to them through crossover trials of introducing foods that Dr. J. Joe is correct, you know, because unfortunately there's so much garbage on the Internet about non-IGE food intolerances, and I'd say gluten-free and casein-free are at the top of the list, you know, that if we don't understand where they're coming from, they'll just go see another, uh, you know, homeopath or whatever, or a chiropractor, and, and uh, you know, get sold these mega vitamins and so forth. And I think that we have a role to try to help families, you know, get back on better diets, you know, get rid of some of their ridiculous food exclusions and so forth, but it takes patience on our part in understanding. One last thing, though, that is critically important that Dr. Keene pointed out is the role of psychology. You know, and I've often called our clinic gastropsychology clinic because, you know, we see far more functional abdominal pain that has a crossover. How we lay the groundwork for the, our partnership with psychologists is critically important. You don't blow them off by saying your kid doesn't have pain. Clearly, they, their perception is they have pain. The reality is I, we introduce the psychologists all the time, but we lay the ground because management individuals, not that your kid's crazy, but we're going to basically try to help you manage the pain. You know, and I prefer to think of psychology as pain management specialists, not that your kid's crazy and needs a white jacket, uh, because of how we set the stage to get them in our partnership really improves the outcome. So, Mike, I'm going to play devil's advocate here for a second because, you know, especially from a resident point of view and testing and going out for the future, you know, we, we now know why you guys make all this money, right, because you do all these procedures for reassurance. <laughs> so, you know, we, we, <laughs> we see patients all the time whose parents want, you know, uh, an MRI because they're convinced that a child has a brain tumor, yet we are certainly told and encouraged not to order brain MRIs for all of these patients. So if you could just comment on, you know, how you guys sort of get around that and when you should and shouldn't do it and what the right answers are for the test for these residents. Yeah, that's a very good point. And I think Dr. G and Oak can comment as well. I think basically the, the cost is always a critical factor. You know, when you get into procedures, and I would include MRI, CTs, those types of things that are basically, you know, 15 grand a pop. You know, procedures, the endoscopy cost for is about five grand or so. And then it comes way down for the other diagnostic testing. So that has to all be factored in. But we try to do the least amount first and set up the right expectations. And we do it in sort of like tier testing, you know, sort of the, the maybe the stool inflammatory markers and serum inflammatory markers may do some testing in some of these where they throw um, histories of specific food allergies, IgE or non-IgE. They're kind of begging the question that they're going to end up getting that type of diagnostic testing. But, no, we, we basically try the therapeutic and the mindset and all the things that Dr. Keene referenced in terms of treatment and peppermint oil and yada, yada. And then if, if on follow-up escalating and they're not back in school and so forth, then at some point all of us will end up doing a, that next level reassurance. And if the parent doesn't buy in psychologically, you know, to what we're telling them, then, then we've, we're at an impasse. And we have to try to, in my opinion, decide do you go to send them for a second opinion somewhere else, or do you do the procedure that is, you bill as the definitive procedure that, you know, you're not, your child doesn't have cancer uh, of the stomach, and which they may, well, grandpa died of cancer last year of the stomach. I'm sure that my five-year-old's got stomach cancer. You know, the, and then the kid is convinced. They got, so I think that we have, to, everyone is kind of a, uh, 
a sort of a dance, if you will, but I totally agree with you. We have to be cautious about over-testing. And if, when we do test, we lay the groundwork that this will be reassuring that everything is okay. And that's when the test comes back normal, they're reassured. But I totally agree with your point. Uh, Dr. G or O, do you guys have any comments from your standpoint? Yeah. So Mike, this is Monica. So um, I wanted to, um, and, and this is for all the residents, look, we are physicians. It is our charge, it is our, our, our privilege to be advocates for kiddos, but we also need to be able to stand on that wall and be ready to be fired by a family if you don't think a test is indicated. I've had a family who they read, because everybody's, they know medicine, they read on the internet for a kid who is an encopretic. Oh no, my, my friend said I needed to have a CT scan. And I was with a medical student, which was truly embarrassing. And, and the father said, if you're not willing to do a CT scan, and when I was trying to say, I have no interest in hearing whatever else you have to say and then you hope that the next person will re reassure but it, it is a bad idea to be zapping these kids left and right to treat parents and we're not treating parents we're treating kids and and you know you you take that on your conscience you know and and I and I think that we need to be willing to be able to say no gently but to be able to say no well said and totally agree all right. I think we are right on time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.